Hi, I'm Maddie Sloan and welcome to this special episode of Snap Happy The Photography Show. 2020 has brought us many challenges and the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our way of life. For many of us, living in isolation has been difficult to say the least. What have you been doing to stay creative at home? Well, that's our theme for today. We're going to find out how the pandemic has affected the industry and we'll get some practical tips for exercising our own skills at home. First, let's cross over to Harvey Bay in Queensland to find out how Darren Leal is staying creative at home. G'day everyone, I'm in Harvey Bay, Queensland, a beautiful part of our planet. I should not be here right now. Unfortunately, we had trips this year to Russia, Mongolia, I'm supposed to be in Alaska, uh, and trips to China even, all of them canceled. As you know, COVID has changed our lives forever. I love to work on projects, and something I've thought about for a long time is what can I do in my own backyard? So I've decided to photograph something that I think a lot of people have difficulty in photographing. It's a dangerous animal at times, oh, and mine just bit me. Um, and I'll introduce you very quickly because I'm getting attacked here to Millie. Oh. The new pet in our life. The great thing about pet photography is that you can actually take your time, go through and think through what you would like to get as a result. So we can actually use this ball as a prop to attract Millie, get her interacting, jumping, running, all that sort of thing. I like to get someone else involved with me, so Julia is actually helping with this. It's very difficult for me to do everything, but someone helping me can make a big difference to this type of photography. We can nearly use any type of camera for pet photography. So I've got a, a general purpose lens here, a short 24 to 120 millimeter lens. I've also got a longer telephoto, 100 to 400. 100 to 400 is gonna be a little bit harder work because you've got less depth of field and it's a higher magnification. So generally, as much as possible, I'm gonna try and use a general purpose lens um, to start at least and then maybe if I can look at some specialized photograph um, scenario that works with the longer telephoto lens then I'll have a crack at that. Don't forget also we can use our smartphones. Our smartphones are fantastic for candid work as well. The great Hollywood actors would often have that saying, never get involved with children or animals. Well, I disagree a little with that because we can have a lot of fun. We're shooting in the house. I've turned all the lights on, We've got reasonably bright, and we're using window light to our advantage as well. So I'm looking at very simple settings here. A for aperture priority. I set the aperture, the camera sets shutter speed for me. ISO 1600, you could consider auto ISO as well. And F4 or 5.6, so I open your aperture up and continuous focusing. I'm going to try and lock as much as I can on the animal's face. Now there's a couple of options here today. One is to do a standard old focusing technique, but some of the new cameras have AI technology and they will automatically read the animal's face. I highly recommend recommend you look into that with your own cameras. I've got all my settings right. So right now, she's not doing the right thing. I'm gonna get her attention. Hey, Millie, hello, hello. Oh, look at that, cute shot. So I finished my shoot, had a fantastic time. I now wanna look at my images. And the one program I really love to do that with is Adobe Lightroom Classic. I'm gonna come over here to my preset, and these are presets I've made myself. So I'm actually going to click on Vibrance Base. And if you look in the panel here, you can see it's just changed the very basic ones of contrast, shadows, and it's added a bit of vibrance in and sharpened the image as well. I'm gonna click on the Crop tool here, and I'm going to try and crop out that line through there. And I should be able to do that. Yep, I can just like that. I'm gonna just move Millie to there to be better balanced. Double click. And you can see now I've got a clean background. Now I'm going to come down to effects and I'm just gonna add a little vignette in. Now, I don't use vignettes a lot, but in this case it will suit a vignette and maybe just drop off how dark it is a little bit too. I'm then gonna go back to basics and I'm going to click on my adjustment brush and I'm going to target this area of her face. 
and then go to exposure. And obviously if I go too far, it's not going to work. Often I'm just adding a tiny little extra and I'm going plus half a stop of light there. And that's just helping to put a little bit of brightness into her face there. And my last thing, I can't stress this enough, is you want to be light bright to the right. And I do that often with whites. So I'm going to bring my whites across and actually get the exposure correct. In this case, I'm pretty happy with that. And the last thing I might do is just tone back highlights a little bit there. And that'll just tone back this area here. Everything there, what it says, is exactly what it would do. I hope you like that. It's a little bit more advanced, it's not basic, but how quick and easy was that to do in Adobe Lightroom Classic? Some great tips there from Darren. We'll hear from him later in the show. Here are some images that you may recognise. This series of monochromatic family portraits were taken during quarantine and have been shared on social media over 75,000 times. The artist behind these images is Rowena Meadows, a documentary photographer based in Melbourne. And she joins us now. Hi Rowena, tell me what inspired these images? When I first started hearing about the lockdown and how long we were looking at being in quarantine, I started thinking about how people were going to manage their physical and emotional boundaries when they're spending so much time with um, people in their family. And I started to hear the word enmeshed. Um, I think it's something I might have learned in, um, at university about families who, where their individual identities kind of blur and end up becoming like each other. And I thought, how can I express that in a photo? So I thought about how we could all look the same in a photo and obviously choosing a colour and dressing in that one colour seemed like a way to start. So yeah, I only intended to do just one. My family actually cooperated really well with me, which they don't usually do when I want to <laughs> photograph them. <laughs> so there was just something in the act of seeking out all those colourful items that was sort of uh, bonding and there wasn't too much conflict for the first one so I <laughs> thought maybe we could do some more. The response was huge they were even published in the Good Weekend magazine how did that feel? Surreal and great I still am shocked how the photos were received it doesn't make a lot of sense to me but um, I'm just grateful for the attention that it's brought to my other work so it's, it's been great. That's incredible. You've actually started your career in psychology. How has that helped shape you as a documentary photographer? I consider my psychology training to be my whole training for being a documentary photographer. Um, both careers are really about making sense of what it means to be human and both require an unbridled curiosity in human behaviour. So I think with being a psychologist, I would listen to people's stories and perhaps reflect, reflect them back to them with my words. When I spend a day with a person or a family, I am experiencing their life and living uh, with them for a day and I reflect back what I see with my pictures. Seeing your life reflected back to you in a book can be incredibly validating and you know, in some cases, if it's done very sensitively, therapeutic. Tell me about your day in the life series. Yes, so I spend around 10 hours with a family or a person and I just exist in their world for the day. Um, I encourage them to keep it as ordinary as possible. I go to soccer practice, the supermarket, public toilets, like <laughs> wherever, <laughs> wherever they go, I go. Um, and the idea is just to make a, an honest as possible reflection of an ordinary day. The photos end up in a book. Um, and a book is the, the most important part of the process. It's not a choice. Most people these days tend to share their images on social media. So why do you produce books? A lot of times when people get hire a photographer, the photos just sit on a hard drive. They never get printed. Maybe they print two or three uh, that go on a wall um, or on social media. But there's something about the tangible act of having a book. A lot of my families, it's a ritual where they will all sit down and pick up the book and look through it. And particularly if I revisit them once a year or once every couple of years, they'll end up with um, a tangible family history that they can 
pass on for generations. Yeah, in incredible. All my clients end up with a book. Uh, the book is the best way for me to control the narrative. It's a very intentional process, the selecting of photos and the sequencing. I need to make sure I have visual variety. I need to make sure I have a balanced representation of the people in the, in the photographs, their relationships. I'm really passionate about the book. You print your books through Memento. Why is that? I love Memento. I've uh, been printing with them for, I think, six years. They are obsessed with the craftsmanship and I am so impressed with the way they handle my colours. Honestly, it just feels like a collaboration working with Memento. I call them up with the dumbest questions all the time <laughs> and um, it always feels like we're working on something together and I, I love that. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on this interesting interview in uh, COVID-19, but I've enjoyed every second. Thank you, Maddie. I love talking to you. If you would like to check out more of Rowena's work, head over to rowenameadows.com.au. And to start your own photo book today, check out Memento on the link below. Now that quarantine restrictions are being lifted, I'm out of the house and I'm in the Blue Mountains to visit the editor of the Australian Photography Magazine. We want to find out what the publication is all about and how the pandemic has affected the photography industry as a whole. Mike, welcome to this special episode of Snap Happy. Now tell us about the Australian Photography Magazine. Well, Australian Photography Mag is Australia's only monthly photography magazine. We've been around for 70 years this year. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, and our main aim, I guess, is to make people better photographers. We have tips on taking better images, we do profiles on photographers, we do reviews on gear, and we have a bunch of competitions as well so people can enter their work. It's really important to us that we showcase other people's work, Australian photographers, and that's a big part of what we do. So you are a keen photographer yourself, tell us about that. I'm a journalist by trade really, and so that's what I've always done, but photography was always a part of um, a lot of the writing I did, and I, I've always done a lot of travel photography. When I was younger I travelled a lot and started to get a lot of my travel uh, photography published, um, which is sort of what gave me my break in the industry. Um, my passion has always been with travel photography, I suppose. I really enjoy uh, wildlife photography as well. And I've travelled a lot around the Middle East and uh, parts of Central Asia, which are really special to me. Places Beautiful. like Iran or Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and weird places like that. <laughs> um, and so my experience of photographing places in that part of the world is something I've always really loved. Have you got a favourite image that you just hold close to your heart and go, wow, and it just brings back so many memories? Yeah, I, I guess my experience of, of photographing the people that you meet along the way and how that you can look back on those photos now and go, oh, that was the time I you know, hitchhiked a ride with that crazy dude <laughs> who ended up having dinner with his family yeah. in his village or something like that. That's the stuff that you, you know, makes photography special, I suppose, and it, it can remind you of those those Moments. really amazing times, yeah. yeah, which were super weird at the same time. <laughs> but also fun. Yes, but also fun, <laughs> yeah. How would you say the pandemic has affected the photography industry, good or bad? I'd say it's been tough, like not to try and sugarcoat it at all. Um, I know a lot of uh, journalism especially has really, you know, suffered through this. To me, it really shows the importance of supporting the little players. A lot of the photographic community in Australia are small operations like AP or like Snap Happy even. Um, and we're the ones who, who won't, you know, will struggle and will need to really work hard to ride this out. So my advice and hope is that people will support the little operations, go to their local camera store, go on a photo workshop, enter a photo competition, do the little bits like that that can really help. So Mike, Photographer of the Year competition, it's huge. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, so we've been running it for eight years um, and it's the largest competition for amateur photographers in the Southern Hemisphere. This year there's $30,000 in cash and prizes. Um, and it's a portfolio competition, so what we ask entrants to do is submit their four best images on a bunch of different themes. Um, and the best image will take out the title of Photographer of the Year for 2020. Amazing. Now, do you have any hints or tips for anyone looking to enter? Well, no. I mean, it's it's difficult to enter a competition. E everyone will know that. I think the, the challenging thing for any entrant to do is to try and into something that surprises the judges, you know, an ordinary subject captured in an extraordinary way or a 
interesting framing on a subject or a story, that kind of thing. Because it's a portfolio competition, we're asking photographers to really think about how their images work together. We're not after just one image, but we want four that tell a story and work as a cohesive set, which is a difficult thing to do. Um, but that's really the key to a winning series, is looking at how all your images work together and the story that they tell. Looking forward to it. So Mike, thank you so much for your time today. Stay safe Pleasure. and stay creative. Thank you. I set sail for Antarctica in early March, and like many others, I was caught up on a ship in the pandemic. This meant I spent 16 days in isolation in my cabin, and then another 14 days in a Melbourne hotel room. For me, designing a photo book is the perfect isolation project. So let's take a look at the steps involved. First, you need a theme or an idea. What's your photo book going to be all about? There are lots of options. It could be a portfolio of your best photos from 2019, a family album, or a recent holiday or a photo tour. In my case, I started with a book of my best photos from Antarctica this year. The next step is to collect all of the best photos you have that you can use in the project. Lightroom has all sorts of ways to collect and order your photos. And as a suggestion, you might like to make a new collection and drag all your potential photos there. So now you have the idea and the photos. What is the photo book going to look like? Is it going to be something large and magnificent like my Middlehurst book? Or perhaps it's going to be something small and personal, like this book of a photo tour to Lord Howe Island. A large book might be best for some grand landscapes, while a smaller book may be more appropriate for photos of a young family. The reason I suggest you decide on the physical size of your photo book early is because it can affect the photos you choose to include and how those photos fit onto the page. For instance, if you have a horizontal or a landscape format book, it might not work very well if most of your photos are vertical or portrait orientation. And since most photographers shoot both horizontal and vertical photos, I suggest a square format book because it produces a better overall balance between the shape of the book and the photos it holds. So now we have the shape of the photo book, how many photos are you actually going to put in it? As editors, we need to keep our photo book interesting. And so this means having a smaller number of really strong photos. And that's much better than a large number of photos where the quality is diluted by some average images. Try to eliminate photos that are similar and that are technically poor and just show your very best work. If our photo book is going to look its best, we need to give the printer good quality files. So it's back into Lightroom to double check the exposure and color balance of every shot. Enlarge your files up to 100% and check them thoroughly for sensor spots and minor imperfections. Lightroom has a great spot removal tool. So now we're ready to place all the photos into a book design. Lightroom Classic has a book module that will automatically generate a book design for you. By moving all your photos into a collection, as we discussed earlier, you can just click on the ebook module and it will generate a book design for you. There's an auto layout feature Choose left blank, right one photo for a clean design. Memento also has a great design program which makes the process really easy and then even easier to order the book. If you're using a dedicated design package like InDesign or Memento, you'll need to export your photos from Lightroom first. I'm happy exporting JPEG files, but ensure you use a high quality setting, 80% or higher and Adobe RGB color space. I also output full size files as the design software will resize the photos automatically. You need a book title, you should also put your name on the cover and then you can decide if each photo needs a caption or if you'll write a little introduction up the front of the book or maybe you'll do both. One advantage with Memento software is that once your book is finished you can upload it directly to them for printing. However, no matter how you're producing your book you should output a PDF proof first. Share it with a friend or a family member to check for spelling mistakes and double check yourself that the photos all look fantastic. And essentially, that's it. Of course, you'll find there are lots of other little things to consider, but that's part of the enjoyment of putting together a photo book. If you're interested in reading a little more about setting up your own portfolio project, 
you can download an ebook I've produced by visiting my website, betterphotography forward slash snap happy. Well, that's it from me, and hopefully we don't have too much more time in isolation. But if you do find yourself with time on your hands, now you have plenty of projects to keep you busy. For most of us, when we think about photography, danger is not one of the things that comes to mind. But for some, risk is an essential part of the job. Russell Ord is an internationally acclaimed surf photographer. His imagery is up close, bold and exciting. As a trained firefighter, he knows all about measured risk. But as a photographer, he pushes the boundaries to get some amazing, never before seen images. Russell joins us now from his home in WA. Russell, what led you to surf photography? Um, basically, I just got injured surfing myself and instead of sitting on the lounge for a few months, I just picked up a camera, I borrowed a mate's camera and then just started shooting friends and it basically took off from there. Now, as I mentioned, you are no stranger to danger. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt completely out of your comfort zone? Not really, like you, you kind of work up to situations, you expand your comfort zone. So, you know, what your comfort zone might be like two or three foot waves, mine is like 10 or 15 foot. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of expanded over the years. But I mean, even things go wrong. Last, last week I dislocated my shoulder surfing and, you know, probably wouldn't have been able to get in without help. So that was definitely out of my comfort zone then. You've shot dozens of covers and features for some big magazines. Do you have any favourite images that you can share with us? Yeah, I've got plenty, like, well, not plenty. I've probably got a, a handful, like, and most of those images have got stories behind it on how difficult it was to, to take. When things are difficult and you get that one shot where it's more like a rare shot, they're the ones I kind of look back on and see effort. Now, how close were you to get this shot? <laughs> Oh, a foot away from the, the board and you, you know, obviously you've got to keep your wits about you, having your, you know, keeping your eyes open and just making sure, you know, you're not going to get run over. And it's a fin to the face. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's easier working with surfers like this because they just hold their line like they're used to working with photographers. Yeah, gorgeous. Well, let's touch on um, this shot here as well, because this is huge. <laughs> and definitely not my type of wave. I wouldn't be jumping in there. Uh, are you not scared at all, or there's just no no fear when you're in the water? Well, this one I shot off the ski, so I'm not scared at all. I could have I could have been having a glass of wine and eating cheese and biscuits. So the, <laughs> like the one, the person that should be scared is Mark Matthews, the one at the back there with the camera. He's probably putting photographers out of business taking shots like this. So, <laughs> The shot in itself probably wasn't worth the, the impact that Mark took because the wave's so big, it probably would have looked better if the wave was a bit smaller. Let's just touch on this and take us through the step by step. How many shots are you taking to get that? I probably took four or five shots and they're just sort of byproducts of when I do trips with surfers, like um, I just love shooting the empties. I think they look better. You know, some of these places you go to is 15 hours drive, two hours along the beach and another hour out in the jet ski. So that's the, the fun in the whole thing, just the um, adventure. Now you're known for big wave shots, but you also cover the whole surf culture. I love the contrast in these. Let's have a chat about these and just take me through the process of how you're creating this image. They're just spur of the moment sort of portrait shots. And when we went down to lockdown um, with the coronavirus, I was just thinking, you know, what else can you do? You know, so I'm using the, a, a longer lens, so I'm doing the 1.5 metres away, and that's what I like shooting the most, you know, people and, and learning what they do. When I think of surf photography, I never would have considered a medium format camera like the Fujifilm GFX. It's an unusual camera for this genre, wouldn't you say? I'm shooting everything on Fuji, so mainly the X-series camera, like in the water. You do get addicted to the, the files though. Like you get, a, you get a special shot with the GFX, you know, at 100 megapixel and you, you know, and then you go to print with it. That's where it's quite kind of special. But if you, if you had a job to do where you can't miss a moment, then I'd, I'd step back to the X series. But if you've, if you've got a client or you've got a personal project you're working on where you're gonna print big, then I'd, I'd use the GFX. And yeah, it's special when you see it printed big. What is it about the X-Series that you enjoy so much? With the X-Series, it's really just the, the size and um, it feels like a camera. You know, and when you travel, you're taking away a small camera that can do a really good job. And I really notice that more so when you're dealing with people. 
like with the X100 series, you'd go into like a, a shaping bay or something like that and you just say, look, I'm just doing some practice shots and then they'd go back to normal and they'd say, yeah, I'm ready for my photo shoot now and you go, that's good because I finished, you know. <laughs> it's that kind of thing where it's unobtrusive and, um, and they do an amazing job. When you travel a lot too, you know, you're not getting hit up with um, excess baggage as much either. Yeah, of course. You were recently the subject of a multi-award winning doco. Tell me about that. That's kind of just pure luck. Like <laughs> Darren McKay, the, the producer, was filming on a beach years ago and I ran into him and he kind of just, we just started talking and then he's, he was just getting out of the mines and um, started filming and he said, have you got any projects coming up? And I was kind of at that stage, I was a little bit disillusioned with my own work. So I said I was going to start pushing my own boundaries and then he goes, oh, can I start filming it? Um, can I make a, you know, like a web clip, two minute web clip? And I said, yeah, sure. And then, and then it just blew out of proportion. It kind of just, just grew legs couple of heads really and then blew into a <laughs> documentary so that's probably where it started it just got bigger than I thought. Thanks so much Russell for sharing with us today if you'd like to check out more of Russell's work head on over to russellordphoto.com. COVID-19 has changed our lives forever what it's allowed me to do is reflect on some of the photography I used to really love to do as a young man and that was to go down and visit lakes rivers and creeks very close to my house. I used to spend hours and hours and hours and it allowed me to hone my skills as a nature photographer. So I've got a long telephoto lens, 100 to 400 millimeter. I've got a great camera, aperture priority. I set the aperture, camera sets shutter speed for me automatically. I've upped the ISO a little bit to 800 ISO. It kicks up that shutter speed for me. And of course my aperture is wide open, allowing in as much light as possible. This combination, along with continuous focusing, allows me to track birds and get into the action and get the best results possible. Look at this cool subject just behind me. Australian black swan. I've always wanted to get a black swan sitting on its nest, eggs hopefully, and even better, the cygnets. Never got that shot, this is my big chance. The very reason you might want to come to a local lake or river is because the birds are actually desensitised to people. They're used to people. So it's a fantastic opportunity for you to be able to get closer than you normally could. Your 100 to 400 mil will help a lot too, but the animals themselves are used to people. Highly recommend it. It'll get you the shot you're after. Something I love to do in these situations is to give a bit of working distance. Again, the longer telephoto lens will offer that. I also keep my voice down and my movements to a minimum. This helps the bird. She's sitting on a nest. She's used to people, but she still can get upset and I don't want to upset her. So as much as possible, I limit my movement. And the other thing I'm going to try and do is get different photographs. So I'm going to use my zoom lens to my advantage. I've got a 100 mil to a 400 mil. So in this case, on this camera, it's actually a 200 to 800 mil because of the sensor size. So that can be pretty handy. 800 mil, I can actually crop in and just get a tight headshot if I want to. So I've got myself into a very comfortable position here, and that is one knee on the ground and one knee up and I'm resting my elbow actually on my knee. And the reason for that is it acting like a tripod. So again, with the settings I've got, I can take a couple of standard photographs and then I'm gonna wait for that special photograph. So I'm gonna be patient. And there, there you go, the head just moved a little bit nicer position there. I've got my focus locked on her head and I'm getting the reflection of her in the water. It's a beautiful photograph. So I mentioned birds a lot, but there's a lot of other things to photograph here as well. We've got frogs, we've got plants, lots of beautiful plants. Again, the 100 to 400 mil lens will actually act quite well as a macro lens. So I've spotted something here to photograph. I'm gonna go full telephoto, aperture priority, F8, 5.6. Again, I uh, wanna get that shutter speed up and I've actually gone to 1600 ISO this time because the light's starting to drop. I'm gonna aim up, simple as that. Again, Adobe Lightroom Classic is going to enable me to process this image very quickly and very simply. Here we go. I've got my presets on the left-hand side. I'm going to use Vibrance Punchy this time. So I click on there and it's processed 
the image for me in base form. And if I have a look again, contrast has been changed, shadows, and I've put in a bit more vibrance this time. I've punched up the colors and it's auto sharpened for me. This is all done with one click of the button. I then click on the crop tool and I'm going to come down and crop in tighter onto the swans, get into the action. Now I've got a lot of pixel information in this file. Even if you've got a 20 megapixel file to start with, I can crop 50%, I've still got 10 megapixels, that's a load of information. Double click, have a look, that's starting to look really nice. I might just add a little bit more shadows, look what happens when I change the shadows. And again, if you're trying the different sliders, try to extreme so that you can see the effects. It's a very visual program. I'm going to go quite a bit up to say 70 with shadows. And if we go and have a look at detail, look at that. The detail is just beautiful in there. Oh, more babies. And I'm going to say I'm very happy with that. And then hit five. And I know then it's one of my best images. It's five star rated and I can send it off to be published or used on this TV show. How about you join myself and our team in the field in 2020? We have great events on Lady Elliot Island in Sydney and Melbourne. We've even got bookings into 2021 and 2022. Visit worldphotoadventures.com.au the shape of the world is changing. I didn't even know what Zoom was until the pandemic broke, but now it's one of the most popular teleconferencing tools on the planet. So how do we best adapt to our current situation? I'm going to ask our retail experts. Joining me now via Zoom is Saul and Howard Frank from Camera Electronic. Hi boys, how are you going? Good, Maddie. how are you? Hey Maddie. The pandemic has been tough on retailers. What's been your experience? It's been interesting. It's uh, something that none of us probably ever expected or thought we'd live through, but the way everyone's banded together as a community, our staff have been amazing, our suppliers, our customers, everyone's just been so supportive to help everyone through this tough time. Yeah, we try to uh, practice all the social distancing rules in store and we've had trestle tables put in front of the counter. Uh, we're, we're sitting here on the showroom floor and uh, we're, we're close to each other, but we're related, so it's okay. <laughs> We've got great hand sanitizer available on every counter. So we're, we're trying our best and the customers have been amazing and uh, the staff have been awesome. What are some of the must have products at the moment? Yeah, so the Mavic Air 2, this little baby here. I did a test fly with a, a drone pilot over here called Michael Halawana and we did some stuff over the Optus Stadium in Perth and around the Swan River in the city and we just found it was really good, easy to use, really stable in the, you know, if there was a bit of wind it was still really stable. Uh, really good dynamic range, good in low light. If we took it out at dusk or dawn, it, it performed really well. And uh, it was just a massive upgrade on the, on the previous one and really small, light and compact lot. If you can see the size of this box here, this has the drone with a case, uh, three batteries, uh, spare blades, controller, everything all there. And you just uh, hook your mobile phone up and use that to fly it all and it's easy or you can use the controller in the box. Probably more safe way to be a pilot these days. <laughs> Now let's just touch on some other products for teleconferencing. Yeah, look, as you say, Maddie, Zoom seems to be the uh, new way that we're all communicating a lot of the time, and there's a lot of different things that can uh, make your life easier with that. It's uh, there's uh, some really cool lighting you can use, like uh, Prophoto C1, screen. the Prophoto C1 Plus. It actually works with an app on your phone, so it'll flash. Plus, you can actually have it like a constant light, good for video. You can even pop off the little uh, soft diffuser and then you can add uh, coloured gels onto it. So there's a lot of cool new items out there. And then the other thing that's quite important is, of course, a lot of us are using phones and things like that. So one of these little Joby tripods here, simple as this. And then here you go. Yeah. And so you can use that like that. Also a cool new product from Rode called the Video Mic Me. So you can hook that up and get even better sound out of the iPhone and then use like a pro photo light. So you've got studio quality light, studio quality audio, using your iPhone, doing Zoom conferencing. It's really cool. Plus being on the go, you want to be wireless. So we've got these cool new uh, products from Rode. Rode is an Australian brand as well. Rode Wireless Go coming in black or white as well. And so the white's really cool. If you're in a wedding party or something like that, and you're going to mic up the bride and groom, great option there that it'll be white rather than showing a black one like this. Well, let's touch on some storage and post-production products as well. Oh, there's a range of things. I mean, a lot of people are getting into scanning, you know, they're scanning all their old photos at home. There's a little Epson product called a FF680W, little fast photo scanner. 
Um, get all your old prints out, scan them, catalog them. Uh, use a good quality monitor like an ASO or a BenQ so it's Adobe certified and you know exactly what your color is going to look like. So get into some editing, scanning, scan your old film, get all your old shoeboxes and slides out. There's a little uh, product called an Epson V850 Pro. I was a little, it's a, it'll do an A4 piece of uh, paper, but it has masks to do all your old slides and negatives. Incredible. So we're used to seeing big events from you guys every year. How has the pandemic affected that? Oh yeah, thanks Matty. Good Great question. question. We've been, uh, the last five years since 2015, we've been running Photo Live Expo over here and we, the first year we had around 800 people and you know over the years we've had up to about 3,000 people through in a day which has been amazing. This year we thought we still really want to do something, what can we do? So we're going live and online and going global so we've got about 25 speakers over the weekend. Uh, from all over the world, you're going to see Photo Live Expo come together. Everyone that loves photography and videography. There'll be there'll be cool stuff like there'll be all the normal presentations, but then there's also going to be some amazing stuff like a, we're going to do a live studio fashion shoot with Steph King, who's a great fashion photographer from over here. And actually, uh, this stuff will all be broadcast out live online. We're going to be doing uh, something pretty cool, a live edit off. We're going to have Christian Fletcher versus Peter Eastway. They're both going to be given an image to edit. A and raw shot and they have to edit it. And They've it got is going 10 to be minutes amazing. to do a live edit against each other online and see who's really the best. Incredible, boys. Awesome. Well, I guess we'll see you there. No problems, Maddie. Thanks, you too. Stay safe and stay creative. In the last season of Snap Happy, we met Russell Brown, the Senior Creative Director at Adobe in America. He's well known for his mobile approach to photography, using only smartphones, drones and 360 cameras. After processing these photos in Lightroom and Photoshop, the resulting images are mind-blowing and often out of this world. We cross now to Russell at his home in San Francisco, where he shares with us some mobile photography tips and techniques. I'm at home during this pandemic, but I'm staying creative. I really want to get out into the world and travel, but I can't. So I'm going to demonstrate a great project that you can do at home. I found a flower in my garden, and you all might be able to find a flower. I have a grey background here. It's a simple medium grey background, and that's key to success for this project. I have my iPhone up and running, and I'm using some C1 Pro lights here to light this up. but. You could use a simple torch to light your flower. You could light it with a LumaCube or you could even light it with sunlight. The key to success though is a gray background. The results we're gonna get will look like this. Cool, let's get started. Let's go right over to my phone right over here. I've got this set up with my lights and I'm going to take a shot just like that. You can see here on the screen that it's nicely lit and I have a gray background. I can then shift over to Adobe Lightroom here on my phone. It will then take that image and automatically upload it into the cloud. Then I can move right over here to Lightroom on the desktop. So let's go right over here to Lightroom here on the desktop and here is the image that I just took right here. I can make my adjustments to the image to make it look just right here in Lightroom, but make sure that the background is nicely gray and notice there's some variation to the background and that makes for the best results. I now do a right click on this image and edit in Photoshop and this is where the magic happens. Here we are in Photoshop and I'm going to select some textures. These happen to be flypaper textures I'm going to take one of these textures from my library here, drag it out and drop it on the image. Check it out. I can scale this and position this till it fits the image just like that. Then hit my enter key. I'm going to zoom in on this texture. So cool. I love the flypaper textures. Here it is. Wait for it. It's simple. It's easy. Select your blend modes and change it from normal to overlay. Overlay, as you can see on the screen, respects the highlights and shadow detail in the image and it overprints the image for the results you see here. It's really, really nice and this could be the end of my story, but let's do one more thing. Let's go in and add a mask down here to my texture. 
Then let's turn off the visibility of the texture and use a great feature called Select Subject right here. Select Subject grabs the flower. I turn on my texture and I target the mask that I created right over here, the layer mask. And then with a brush, I can paint into the mask. I currently have my brush opacity set to 20% right up here at the top. Check this out, I'm painting with black and then I paint into the mask. It's only affecting what's inside the selected region and each time I click, it gets softer and softer. So I'm differentiating between my background and the foreground here of my flower. I'm going to deselect, zoom back out. Wow, so simple, so perfect. Photograph with an iPhone into Adobe Lightroom, then here into Photoshop on the desktop and using a texture. I could even go out and photograph my own textures around my house. So combine all of those together. You're trapped at home. Stay creative. Here's a great project to give a try. Thanks for joining us for this special episode of Snap Happy, the photography show. We hope that it's inspired you and given you some great ideas to stay creative. Please connect with us at snaphappytv.com. There you can find more tips, techniques and special offers from our partners. While you're there, why not sign up to our mailing list to stay in the loop. Stay safe, stay creative and happy shooting.